Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, electoral bonds have actually come to be the, the biggest innovation in, in political financing in India uh, for the simple reason that this has legalized uh, giving unaccounted money to political parties. And uh, although the heading of the finance minister's speech in the budget, while he presented the budget on 1st of February 2017, uh, the title of the two paragraphs was Transparency in Electoral Funding. But what exactly the scheme did and how it has turned out to be uh, has been the exact opposite of transparency because the same day that he made the speech in the parliament, in the afternoon, uh, the same finance minister in a media interaction said that uh, the bond will be bearer in character to keep the donor anonymous. Since February 2, 2016, I have been, 2017, I have been looking for a dictionary which says that anonymity and transparency are synonyms of each other, and I have not yet found it. Now, uh, after announcing this scheme in the budget, it was finally first when the budget papers were available in detail, and then finally when the notification of the scheme was done almost exactly a year later, in February, on February 2, 2018. Uh, when you read the when you read in between the lines, or actually when you read the lines, it turned out that it had done a variety of things. First of all, it amended four laws. The Representative People Act, the Income Tax Act, the Companies Act, and the Reserve Bank of India Act. Now, each of these the amendments, if you look at them in some detail, you find that they are not for transparency, they are anti-transparency. For example, the Companies Act had a provision that no company or a company which has made uh, profit for the last three years can donate not more than 7.5% of its profit to a political party or to any political party. Now, there was a limit for 7.5%. This limit of 7.5% has was removed in that amendment of the Companies Act. In addition, the Companies Act also had a provision that uh, every company had to disclose the name of the political party to which they had made donation and the amount of the donation. This requirement of disclosing the name of the company and the amount of the donation was also removed. So therefore, to say that this will achieve transparency is quite strange. At the same time, the removal of the 7.5% limit uh, and a minor uh, or a tweak to the FCRA around the same time, which changed the definition of a foreign source, made it possible for any foreign entity to set up a subsidiary in India and for the subsidiary to donate as much money as they want to any political party. Now, this opened the floodgates of unaccounted foreign money going into the Indian political system. Uh, similarly, the other amendments to the Representation of People Act, Income Tax Act, etc., uh, all they did was to close whatever uh, little uh, Holes were there through which we could peep in and find out what the political parties are doing. Uh, in addition to this kind of thing, about two years later after that, through uh, the use of Right to Information Act, uh, it turned out, it was learned that the Reserve Bank of India and the Election Commission of India had opposed this scheme in no uncertain terms. The Election Commission of India wrote a letter saying that uh, electoral bonds in the way, shape, and form that they are being introduced will encourage formation of shell companies to donate money to political parties, which obviously 
is, is not what anybody wanted. The RBI said that uh, RBI is the only authority in the country to, uh, to issue uh, you know, currency. And the electoral bonds are supposed to be like currency because if somebody buys the electoral bond and gives it to a political party or to give it to a, a person X buys a bond, gives it to Y, Y gives it to Z, Z gives it to Z, or Z gives it to X, et cetera. And then finally it lands with the political party within 15 days of purchase, it is, it is valid. It is as good as currency. So the RBI had uh, tested against this, but the objections of the RBI and the Election Commission of India were overruled by the finance ministry. And the kinds of notings that finance ministry officials made on the files are actually quite amusing, saying that the RBI does not seem to have understood what was the intention behind this. And the election commissions were election commissioners were called, and they have understood, and they have decided to withdraw their objections. Whereas there has been no withdrawal of that. So against such objections by the statutory by the constitutional authorities, the scheme was introduced. Uh, as soon as the scheme was introduced, it uh, you know several things came out. One was that. It was said that it is completely anonymous. The, the bonds will not be identifiable or traceable in any way. Uh, a journalist from, uh, from the Quint uh, bought an electoral bond and put it through you know, uh, forensic testing. And it was revealed that there was a unique alphanumeric number that the electoral bond held which became visible only under ultraviolet light. So this contention that these were completely anonymous and they were, could not be traceable, uh, could not be traced in any way, shape or form was proved to be wrong. Number two, the provision was, uh, or provision still is, that the State Bank of India is the only bank who is to sell these uh, bonds uh, through authorized branches during a 10 year or during a 10 day window every quarter in the year uh, so uh, the government issued a notification let's say from the 1st of january to the 10th of january state bank of india will sell these bonds through designated branch now <clears throat> it also said that the state bank of india will collect uh, kyc or know your customer particulars but will not share it with anyone at all unless somebody brings a court order. And therefore, the anonymity of the buyer will remain confidential. Now, to any observer of this kind of an activity, it is obvious that if State Bank of India, first of all, if State Bank of India was not to share this information with anybody at all, why would State Bank of India collect? Anyway, to, to say that State Bank of India will collect information and State Bank of India will not reveal this information to the finance ministry and the finance ministry will not uh, release it to its minister uh, is something that is, is not believable, at least to me, if not to anybody else. So it was, the mechanism turned out to be very simple that if a person buys electoral bonds uh, of any amount from the State Bank of India and heads or starts moving towards the, the office of a different political party than the ruling party. And the apprehension was that the State Bank of India's information about the buyer will, will go to the finance ministry and to the finance minister and to the party to which the finance minister belongs. It is independent of any party which is in power. So at the moment, the information goes that XYZ has bought these bonds and the person is headed to, to a different political party. 
and it was uh, speculated that a phone call will go to the person and he or she will be asked so you have bought these bonds uh, where are you planning to donate them now to a to a sensitive <laughs> political party donator this would be enough and the person will then move to the political party in power and donate all those bonds there so the apprehension was that electoral bonds the way they have been operationalized through this information being available ostensibly only to the state bank of india had the potential of choking the funding for all opposition parties now this was expressed as an apprehension in in uh, 2000 february 2018 and subsequently when the data of the sales of electoral bonds for the first year the first full year became available because political parties had to declare it in their statement of income and expenditure it was proved that 95% of the the amount of bonds purchased in that year were donated to the political party in power 200 and i think 15 crores worth of bonds were bought 200 were donated to the political party in power uh, i think 10 crores were donated to the to the next biggest party and 5 crores strangely were not in cash and the scheme has a provision that if any bonds are not in cash within 15 days that amount gets credited to the prime minister's relief fund <laughs> so in the first year Ninety-five <clears throat> percent of the funding through electoral bonds went to the ruling party. <clears throat> In the subsequent years, it has become a little less, just somewhere around seventy <clears throat> percent or so. So, seventy percent, roughly, of the funding through electoral bonds goes to the ruling party. Now, when ruling party has this monopoly of money, obviously, the ruling party has the monopoly of. Uh, contesting elections or i should say winning the elections because rightly or wrongly money has started to play a huge part in the electoral process <laughs> now as soon as the scheme uh, came to be known uh, the association for democratic reforms with uh, with whom i work we filed a petition in the supreme court in august of 2017 uh, there were many reasons one of the main reasons was that the electoral bonds were introduced as a part of the budget and the budget is a money bill and a money bills uh, peculiarity is that the money bill is discussed in the lok sabha and uh, you know members make suggestions for uh, modifications or uh, amendments etc and then once the lok sabha has passed it it goes to the rajya sabha in the rajya sabha the money bills are only discussed 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 the rajya sabha does not have the power to make any amendments to the bills so effectively if there is a majority in the lok sabha then the government of the day can pass any bill they want because if they have majority in the lok sabha even if they are in minority in the rajya sabha rajya sabha cannot amend any of the money bills now the uh, the definition of the money bill under the constitution is that money bills by and large are those which deal with the expenditure and donate uh, and contributions to the uh, what is the consolidated fund of india now elect the electoral bonds have nothing to do with the consolidated fund of india anybody any citizen any company can buy the bond from the state bank of india and give it to a political party which deposits it in a designated account so consolidated fund of india has nothing to do with electoral bonds and therefore legally electoral bonds do not uh qualify to be part of a money bill and that makes the the entire process constitutionally uh, untenable so the introduction of electoral bond scheme was unconstitutional 
This was the first issue in our petition. And of course, there were many others, which, which I do not think I should list here. So the petition was filed on August, in August 2017. It was heard, first hearing was held on October 3, 2017. And after that, it kind of uh, seemed to go into a cold storage. Then we kept filing applications after another. But when the information about the uh, Reserve Bank of India and the Election Commission of India opposing the scheme came out, then we filed another application in March of 2019. Uh, as a result of that application, a hearing was held on April 12. Actually, the hearing was held on April 10, 11, and 12. Now, on April 12, <clears throat> the Supreme Court bench headed by the Chief Justice wrote the following, and I quote, all that we would like to state for the present is that the rival contentions are rival contentions give rise to weighty issues which have a tremendous bearing on the sanctity of the electoral process in the country. I would like to repeat these, uh, this part of the sentence. Uh, contentions give rise to weighty issues which have a tremendous bearing on the sanctity of the electoral process in the country. Such weighty issues would require an in-depth hearing, which cannot be concluded and the issues answered within the limited time available, so and so. Now, April 12th, 2019, the petition raised weighty issues, which had a tremendous bearing on the sanctity of the electoral process in the country. From 2019, April, we are now in, uh, I think we are in uh, 2022. Three years have passed. The Supreme Court has not had time to, to consider these weighty issues. And the sale of electoral bonds has continued. Every time a new scheme is to be is anticipated to be issued, we file an application for an urgent hearing. But we have, I think, filed about five or six applications by this time, <clears throat> but nothing has happened. Now, the Supreme Court seems to be in a, in a, in a slumber or whatever I may say. Uh, there was a hearing subsequently, which were turned out to be very perfunctory, and the order that the bench issued, uh, unfortunately, very clearly indicated that they had not understood what the issues were. So situation is that something like eight to 9,000 crores of rupees have been given to political parties, mainly to the, the political party in power, and unaccounted money, foreign money from any source whatsoever continues to flow into political parties. And Indian democracy very soon, I don't know even if it has, must have been done even now, will be controlled by money, the source of which will not be known. Now, this is not a very happy or a healthy prospect for any democracy. <clears throat> but the other parties, <clears throat> yes, one political party has filed a petition in the Supreme Court with us, but all other political parties pay lip service to opposing the scheme, <clears throat> but they also are kind of <coughs> hopeful that when their time comes, they will also be able to get some donations <coughs> and therefore they are, they go, they are ambivalent about these bonds. This is very unfortunate. The, the, the control of money of, from any source on political system of the country is now legal. And that I don't think I need to say anymore. I have finished. Thank you very much. Any questions? I'm trying to answer them. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chokra. Uh, yes, I think there is a question. Um, what what forms, or oh, sorry, what reforms does political financing require? Would state funding elections help? State funding elections is a uh, is a is a very interesting phenomenon which has been talked about for a very long time. 
the first misunderstanding here is the word state funding. Uh, when we say the state will fund elections, uh, the question to be asked is, where does the state get money from? And uh, on very, very quick reflection, we would realize that it is the money that it gets from citizens by way of taxes, etc., etc. So I have argued for the last three, four years, and now some people have come to accept this, that this should be called public funding of elections. Uh, while <clears throat> this may seem to be just a semantic change, but uh, there are any number of examples where uh, in India, unfortunately, the, the phenomenon seems to be that anything which is governmental is free. In, a, in, a, in an election of the municipal corporation, uh, there was a meeting of candidates, uh, kind of a not general, public meeting with candidates of all political parties and each candidate was asked, what, is, what will you do? And one candidate said, because this was in a, in a kind of a slum area where there were unauthorized colonies, one candidate said that our leader has given us the slogan, Jo zameen sarkari hai, wo zameen hamari hai. So anything which is governmental is considered to be free. Therefore, if we call it state funding, the common person in the street does not get disturbed by it. But if we call it public funding, then I think people's view would be slightly different. Anyway, this is one issue. The, the difficult, well, technically or philosophically, it is perfectly all right. Uh, because people are supposed to contest elections for doing public service. Therefore, they should not spend their own money, they should spend public money. That's perfectly fine. But the question, there are, there are two issues here. If we decide that from next year, we will have public funding of elections. Now, one thing that we would need to do is to set out a budget. How much money should be uh, provided for the state funding of elections? Now in the government and in, in most other places that I know, uh, it is based on estimates. And one source of estimate is what did we spend on it last time? And then you add some, uh, you know, 10%, 15%, 50%, 200%. But you need the figure of what, how much did we spend on this? So that would require political parties and candidates to reveal how much did they actually spend? Now, then there is an argument that a candidates are required to give election expenditure affidavits. And they can tell us how much they spend. Now, I can tell you that in the 2009 Lok Sabha election, we analyzed the election expenditure affidavits of 6,753 candidates. At that time, the limit was, I think, about 15 or 16 lakhs. Only four candidates out of 6,573 said that they had exceeded the limit. Only four. 30 candidates said that they had spent about 90% of the limit. So 6,753 minus 34 is 6,719. They said that they had spent between 45 to 55% of the limit. A, a chief election commissioner at that time said that if this is the case, we should reduce this limit and not increase it every time. The point of sharing this actual data is that every candidate lies when they give these election expenditure affidavits. Lying is a, is a non-unparliamentary word. The, I suppose parliamentary word is they under-report. And the there is no limit on the expenditure of political parties. So how will we operationalize public funding is, is, a, is a problem that I am not able to solve. The other issue is that if public funding, funding is given to political parties and candidates for fighting elections, it stands to reason that they should not accept any other money. If they will take public funding, and also continue to take other funding, 
then the whole purpose is lost and it becomes like throwing good money after bad money. It's like telling a, a government employee <clears throat> who is in the habit of taking bribes that we will increase your, you will, will increase your salary five times to stop taking bribes. Unlikely to happen. So state public funding is a very good idea, but it is in the current situation not practical. The only way to control election expenditure is, there are two ways of controlling it. One is that political parties have to become democratic in their internal functioning, including choosing their candidates. Today, choosing the candidates is, a, is, a, is a, the greatest mystery on earth. Why to, they are chosen apparently for something called win-ability. What winability is, nobody seems to know. So it is that is where a lot of money changes hands. And the other is that political parties have to be transparent in their financial affairs. Political parties claim that they deal with public issues and they work with the public, work for the public. But therefore, if they do that, then they should also be willing to share information about how much money do they get, whom do they get it from, how, where, uh, how do they spend it, and how much do they spend. But as I said, the electoral bonds are the now the gold standard for opacity of political funding. Therefore, we are not moving in the right direction at all. Uh, this is all I can say in answer to this question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there, we have a question in the chat, which is, um, how did corporate funding to political parties work before electoral bonds were introduced? Uh, <laughs> that worked very well. Uh, the, the law was that uh, any donation that a political party received, which was more than 20,000 rupees, would have to be disclosed in a statement of donation. So the political party it worked this way that either uh, operates gave uh, 19,999 uh, checks about 200, 400 times, or they gave whatever they wanted in cash. Uh, it is a personal experience of mine that I was on a television debate with a politician and a corporate person. The politician said, we want to take money through check, but the corporate sector does not want to give it by check. The corporate person said, we want to give it by check, but they don't want to take it by check. Now, after I experienced that, I, I had to think about how could that be reconciled? And then after some thought, it occurred to me that the reason is that <clears throat> if the money donations are made by check, then the amounts are clear and laid down. If it is through cash, let us say I am a politician, which I know, I think I would say I'm a corporate sector person and you are a politician. And we meet and you say, I need uh, you know, 10 crores or rupees. And I said, Achaha, we'll send it to you. And I send my person with 10,000 crores of cash. This person, does not meet you personally, but he gives it to, he or she gives it to one of your assistants. And the person says that, you know, says he has given me only nine crores. So the political party person will take nine crores and tell his or her boss that says he has sent only eight crores. So there is a question of, or there is a personal interest and this is part of the reason, or this may be part of the reason why every election we see that the wealth or assets of politicians increase 200 times, 500 times, 6,000 times. Where does that come from? Possibly this is the source and, and it suits both sides. So there is a corporate uh, sector and political sector uh, nexus. And it worked that way 
but this has now legalized it earlier there was some some kind of uh, i suppose shame is a very strong word but some kind of embarrassment but now there is nothing it is perfectly above board Um, and just one last question: uh, Is there a precedent of this kind of electoral funding elsewhere in the world, and what kind of implications have we seen um, occurring <laughs> elsewhere when electoral bonds have been put in place? You see, political funding all over the world is murky. There is no denying that. And in some countries, which I don't want to name, it is it is even worse than us. But the question is. and in those country where it is a little better than us there are better disclosure norms <clears throat> and there is better enforcement of the laws here unfortunately we are making laws in the guise of providing transparency and creating complete opacity so the question is political parties <laughs> and i must say the corporate sector they are not interested in transparency it it serves their selfish partisan short term interests and they are not willing to look at long term national interests unfortunately 